Well, we do have some announcements. Um, on Tuesday is Bible study. And then charge conference on Thursday. Um, any other announcements we can share? Something's coming up with Veterans Day and also the whole Saints Day. Diane, will you speak to that? And there's an announcement in the bulletin um, asking you if you have any additional pictures that you would like included in either. You can either email them to the church or you can um, bring them in. I'll scan them and get them back to you. We do still have the ones that were in previous years. Okay. Any other announcements? I mean, I November 10th, you know, I this one up. Do you guys eat any meat? Okay. I guess no one's coming because they're not eating. <coughs> any other announcements?
which is your favorite bird of the winter? Blue jays. Our first lesson is from Job, chapter 38. And the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this? The darkens counsel by words without knowledge. Gird up your voice, young man. I'll question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you? When I laid the foundation of the earth, tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and heavenly beings shouted for joy? The word of God to the people of God. In our songs of praise are I love you, Lord, in Jesus' name alone.
by God into thy presence. We come this day with joy because you are God. And joy because you've called us to be your people. We pray for each anointing and every gift and giver. And ask, Lord, your blessing upon us. We would be the church this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I got a joy. Whew. Sigh of relief, too. Last night at 10.30, I put the dog out, and he almost got out of my hands, and he ran to the end of his chain, and he went nose to nose with a creature, and I thought it was a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, does that scare you? Anybody that has pets, you understand where I'm coming from? Tommy's thinking, or Timmy's thinking, I can't talk about it. <laughs> no choice. We're supposed to be joyful people. Even Presbyterians are joyful. I saw it on a church sign one time. <laughs> I always thought I heard they were called the Frozen Chosen because of, you know, um, the idea of you know, uh, predestination. Traffic mercies. Okay. Those who are traveling, how about the storms? Those in the path of the storms, there's a lot of cleanup. I, up here we didn't get hit, but down in North Carolina, Virginia, um, Florida, the devastation is unreal. Any others? She's got to be it's tougher than a Steeler linebacker. Take all these, you know, lickings and keep on ticking. Any others? I'd ask you to keep Pastor Lee and the family in your prayers. Um, I don't think he under, he knew that he was coming here until just recently. Yeah. But uh, he will begin duties November 1st. I'd like to put my son on the first. Okay. Can we pray for you too? Yes, you can. Kathy, and what's your son's name? Earl Gerhardt. Earl. Earl Paul. He just arrived in the hospital with some of the problems. Okay, let's keep Earl. And also Kathy and her first. Any others? Remember our military and our family. Military? You might want to keep the ladies in your prayers. Am I, am I seeing this right? You're baking 150 pies. <laughs> That's all you can bake in two days. That's all you can bake. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm thinking about doing apple pies today because the apples are starting to ripen. Yeah. So, what time do we go down for apple pie? <laughs> well, if you want to wait for it to cook, anytime your heart desires. <laughs> Okay, let's keep Jason our prayers. Any others? Let's pray. Father God, we do give you thanks and praise for life. We pray, Lord, to be with our nation during a time of now. There's a lot of discussion, let's say. And there's a lot of polarization. You've called us to be one nation under you. But yet, Lord, we act sometimes like anything but that. Pray, Lord, that you would be with us through this election cycle. Praying, Lord, that the one you want would be the one, literally, becomes the leader of our country. Pray, Lord, for traveling mercies for those who are hitting the road. We lift up all those that have been in the wake of these storms trying to put their lives back together for those who don't know how as the temperatures cool off. We pray, Lord, you'd be with Bonnie, that you would strengthen, Lord, her step, that you'd be with Darla as she tries to be there for every member of the family. We do lift up the leaves. We pray, Lord, that during this time of transition, your anointing 
and your blessing might be upon them. We pray for a very fruitful ministry here in Portage. So lift up Kathy, Lord, that your healing hand would continue to be upon her, and also, Lord, upon her own. Praying, Lord, you would touch him and bless him. We do pray, Lord, for our, our families that, that serve this country. We're praying that you put a hedge around them, but also, Lord, that you would strengthen their families, particularly those who are divided by, by duty to country. We pray for Jace. We lift up all those that are battling COVID. We're praying, Lord, that you would be with, with those that are, are struggling every day just to survive. We pray it all in Christ's holy name. And now we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In our hymn is page 128, He Leadeth Me.
But the sin in my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be the slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Word of God for the people of God. Yes, God. Message is entitled Blind Ambition. There is nothing wrong with a little bit of motivation in our lives. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we all know people who wish had a little bit more of the stuff. Uh, but in fact, if you want to turn in your Bible to that obscure verse in the Old Testament, Babylonians chapter 6, verse 66. Can we find it? Is anybody looking? Tammy says, you're not catching me. <laughs> no, that, that's not in your Bible. Um, but we all know those that you know, take these words as if they were. God helps those that help themselves. That actually is not in there. There's some stuff like it, but not quite like that. And a lot of people, they actually take that as the gospel. They live their life by it. Well, some years ago, I... I had a young man in my congregation I was serving, and uh, he was telling me something. He was serving in Iraq, you know, during the Gulf War. And he told me something I, I really wasn't aware of. In this country, we pride ourselves on good old-fashioned elbow grease. We, you know, we don't mind having some luck, but of course, the will to go out there and make something out of nothing that means something to us. We love Cinderella, Cinderella stories, don't we? We love it, uh, particularly when, a, when one of our own drags themselves up by their own bootstraps, and they make something out of their life. They become a success in the hometown hero. Well, in the, in the Middle East, uh, succeeding in life is actually thought to be more a family matter. And according to this young man who served in Iraq, one of the biggest things our military had to learn was the difference between the two cultures. Um, over there, if you want to hire a man to do a job, you don't just hire him. You hire a lot of his relatives as well. If you want to hire a guy to cut your grass, chances are pretty good. He's going to show up with five or six other you know, people, and they're all going to be expecting to get paid as well. <coughs> now, it's quite possible that this request that James and John make of Jesus for one to sit on his right and one on the left in his coming glory, that could be motivated by this kind of understanding. Now, in Matthew's version of this story, Salome, or Salome, I'm not sure how you pronounce uh, the woman's name, but this was a sister of Mary, the mother of our Lord. And she comes to them, comes to him, and she, she speaks for James and John. And if this is the case, then James and John were Jesus' first cousins. In their mind, this is a family matter. And in a family matter, it takes precedence over every other, you know, situation. Now, Peter had already been named as the rock upon church will be built. Yes, the rock upon which the church will be built. And James and John are probably thinking, no, we, we, we better speak up before we lose our place here. And as Jesus continued to grow in uh, popularity, James and John, by virtue of their, their family ties to him, probably figured they would be the first to cash in with him. It's not that they were trying to get to jump on all the other disciples by being first in line to Jesus' right hand you know, men, but they were probably trying to reinforce the convention you know, in their culture, the, before Jesus assigns a place to someone else. Now, the only problem is regardless of what the conventions of any culture ever happen to be, nobody is ever been able to neatly pin Jesus down in a box. I mean, back then as well as today, Jesus was always on a different page. Well, James and John, 
must have been thinking about the Lord's ministry in terms of this world as they knew it. Jesus had his eyes on God's ways, not the ways of man. And that way, of course, included the cross, but it also included the empty grave. And of course, these guys and their mother are not alone. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know, that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, they worry over them. And the great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, Jesus was forever reminding his disciples what he was about. And what he was about was very different than what anybody thought. Everybody probably thought, if this is the Messiah, he's doing it wrong. Even John the Baptist had questions. There's John languishing in prison, and he sends his, his messengers to Jesus, hey, are you the Messiah, or should we be looking for someone else? Well, in Matthew 18, we have a very similar situation between Jesus and some of his disciples. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child, whom he put among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better if you, if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, Barry, you're a pretty good swimmer, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> How would you like to swim with that sucker hanging around your neck? In the middle of Lake Erie? No. <laughs> okay. Barry doesn't want to be there. Uh, Dawn, you want to try that? No. Nobody but an idiot is going to try and, and swim with an anchor around them. And he, it's, it's short certain death. And Jesus is saying, if you destroy one of these little ones, oh, there is a day of reckoning coming. Well, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they had dreams. <coughs> ambitions like everybody else. And they, along with Simon and Peter, were Jesus' closest uh, disciples. In fact, you always read of them being around Jesus during all the significant events of his, his earthly ministry. When Jesus went up on a transfiguration, Mount of Transfiguration, they were with him. Jesus nicknamed James and John the Sons of Thunder. And my guess is these guys were pretty dynamic individuals. They were rough and ready, tumble, whatever you want to call it, fishermen, when Jesus called them. Actually, they were partners with Peter and Andrew. Well, he calls them Sons of Thunder. I don't know about you, but Sons of Thunder, that, that sort of sounds like a couple of guys you would really like to have on your team when you're going up against you know, a very strong and a ruthless enemy. And it's only natural that James and John would like to move into a leadership position you know, among the disciples. And so it should surprise us that one day these, these sons, of, sons of Thunder they come to Jesus with a request. They wanted to negotiate a better position amongst the company of believers. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, have you ever had somebody come up to you and say, we want you to do for me whatever you ask? Marshall, you probably, Kathy, you had this with your sons, and I'm sure you said, what, what do you want before I say anything, right? Kathy's one mama that's not going to be taken for, you know, like a fool. And uh, neither is Jesus. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism that I am baptized, you'll be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. 
but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now, like most of Jesus' answers, I don't think this is really easily understood. Jesus does seem to be telling them that they will experience what he experiences. But it's not what we would expect. He's going to suffer. They're going to suffer. He's going to be betrayed. They are going to be betrayed as well. He'll give up his life in service to his Father in heaven. And they will give up their lives in service as representatives of him. You will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. And they, of course, have no idea what this really entails until much later in their lives. Now, in fact, James was actually the first of the apostles to be killed. We, we find this recorded in the 22nd chapter of the book of Acts. And he was taken, he was murdered, he was actually beheaded by Herod Antipas, uh, the first of the apostles you know, to be killed. Uh, John the Baptist, uh, you know, Herod beheaded him at the request of his, I guess you call her stepmother, uh, whatever, um, actually his niece. But John lived a much longer life, although a lot of it was in exile. That's what he was writing, probably his gospel and the book of Revelation. James and John were going to drink the cup that Christ drank. They were not going to get what they were asking for here. As followers of the Lord Jesus Christ in our day and age, there is also going to be some measure of uncertainty. Every day we wake up is not just a fresh start, a new beginning, but it's also a brand new day to serve the Lord. But if we truly want to be servants of Christ's kingdom here on earth, we have to be willing to let go and let God. We've got to be willing to go where he wants us to go and be willing to, to be what he wants us to be. Um, how many of us often think in our Christian walk, hey, this isn't what I signed up for? Beer? Yeah, I've been there. Um, but God says, you're still going to go. This is part of my plan for your life. You know, there's nothing wrong with aspiring to be the best that we can be. As long as these are horrible things. And he, that's why God gave us healthy minds and, and, and good bodies. I mean, Jesus does not ever, in this passage, condemn James and John for their ambition. People who achieve great things in this world, by definition, are ambitious people. But it's important to note, however, ambition can be misguided. Um, I have, living right across uh, the street from the Bethany Church, uh, a young man whose ambition has gotten, I mean, Gary Vaughn has so much potential, and yet I see where it's leading him. And I feel so sorry, because I think, what could that, that intellect, all of that energy and power be used for if he was on board in Christ's kingdom? We have so many tyrants running around in this world if their ambition was to serve Christ. Think how much better a world this would be. Our ambition has to be in line with Christ's plan for our life. There's a fine line between ambition and ruthlessness, between ambition and greed. Over the years, you know, our economy has been a pretty topsy-turvy thing. There are people that have lost their entire life savings because some people chose the crooked way to satisfy their ambition. It's an old story. And if you've got a telephone, I'm sure this past week you've had somebody call you up trying to get a hold of your, you know, information so they can rob your bank account or, or you know, use you in some kind of way. And sadly, this old story just keeps on repeating itself. There are some people that will do almost anything to the point of destroying others in their quest to achieve their goals. As a church, our ambition has to be blind. If we're going to best serve God's kingdom here on earth, we have to keep in mind our real reward isn't even in this life. Our real reward is going to be on the other shore in the presence of Christ, the saints, and all the angels. Now the truth is, James and John and all the disciples, they did get it. When they beheld the risen Christ, they got it. With mighty ambition, they 
serve this world wherever the Lord asks them to go. Down in Thomas. I mean, he was the one who wasn't there when the first time they saw the risen Christ. The second time he was. But he said, Lord, unless I see, you know, living proof, I'm not going to believe. But Jesus did show him proof. And the tradition of the church tells us he went all the way to India in his quest to proclaim the risen Christ. All of these disciples, they would stand before both kings and paupers, proclaiming the name above all names. They understood what we need to understand. Christ is risen. Christ is alive today. And that calls us to life even in the midst of death. James became the first to lay down his life for Christ. John was the last of the twelve to die. But of them all, but all of them, once they understood who Jesus was, they did invite Jesus to truly be the Lord of their life. They ended up going places, doing things they never would have, you know, thought of on their own. I don't know what the Lord has in store for you any more than I know what he has in store for me. But this I do know. If we truly let go, and we let God, like the disciples, we're going to end up going places we never thought we'd ever go. We're going to do things we never thought we'd able, ever be able to do. And the best part, the best part is one day, when our name is brought up amongst the heavenly host, we're going to be able to say, I was there, I was a part of that. That was what the Lord was doing in my life. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, how good it is to be part of the family of yours. To be able to know that we are loved and we are forgiven. To know, Lord, that you have a greater plan for our life than this world could ever even put stumbling blocks in our way. We thank you, God, that you deliver us each and every day. And deliver us, Lord, from the snares of the enemy and we Thanks and praise all in Christ's holy name. Amen. And our hymn is page 380.
At the end of the week. And I mentioned this last night, and I'm sure I'll say it to Bethany again today. Um, it goes two ways. There are a lot of churches that probably would have asked for a change in appointment um, when I went through what I went through, you know, with my ex-wife. But um, you didn't ask for that that I know of. And he allowed me to stay and minister which is fulfilling the calling I believe the Lord put on my heart. Yeah. As a young man, I never saw this coming, but uh, God has blessings. And I can honestly say, all the blessings that I have lived through in the kingdom are so much greater than any heartbreak you can ever have. This church will always be special in my heart because I was standing in the narthex um, on the phone with my sisters when my father passed. And... Uh, I asked him to name my two children who died before they were born. And I gave him two girl names, two boy names. And uh, so I want to thank you. You're very special to me. I know it's hard to fulfill what our conference rules are, which basically state that for at least two years I can't do any act of ministry in any form of church. And I will honor that. But by the same token, I live in this community, and if I see you in town, I'm not going to run away from you. I mean, that's just reality. But I can't do funerals, you know, officiate funerals or anything of that nature. But anyhow, I, I do pray God's continual blessing on all of you. Um, the work of the kingdom goes on. And you are really the ministers. I'm just a pastor. Thank you. Now may the grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, be with you now and forever. The love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit guide, direct, and empower your life.